nations far and near he is the way and come what may will not betray the sacred name of our king jesus the gate it's called heaven how our hearts are filled with joy we're finally home hand in hand we all walk down the streets of gold to see our Savior Standing near the throne, the throne of Jesus, dressed in robes made pure as white by His own blood. Then He stands, He lifts His hands, we all bow down and give Him glory. Good afternoon. Glad to have you in here. It's good to be in the house of God. Uh, just want to ask if anybody has a prayer request on my right side. We're going to ask prayer request. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> Lost loved ones and shoulder. Mike. Brother and children. My grandchildren. Grandchildren. Cooney. Lost loved ones. Remember Jimmy Kilby and Tim Kilby. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, John Jackson out of Brazelton, a pastor of a church, has a mass on his lungs. We know one that can take everything away. Amen. Jesus. Go ahead, Teresa. Frank Edmonds. His sister Nikki, she has COVID, and his mom's sister has COVID in Robertsville, North Carolina, and she wanted all those to be remembered. And I also still remember my request that I had in my name. Okay. Remember these? Some with sickness, COVID. Remember them? Anybody else on my right? Let's also remember LC Loves. LC Loves? 
Elsie? Yeah. He's my age. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Oh. Sister? Uh, remember Matt? Not feeling well. Remember Matt? Not feeling well. Uh, thank y'all for praying Monday night for my mom. Uh, she does have a broke collarbone. It's really bad. Uh, went to the surgeon and they said they couldn't do nothing until Tuesday. They're going to look at her again Tuesday because of swelling. So she's in a lot of pain. Her collarbone's supposed to be like this and it's like this. About that much. It's like about a two inch overlap. So please remember her. Uh, remember us too. Trying to help her and everything. Uh, also, uh, uh, Tommy from Kentucky, he called and asked for prayer for his daughter and stuff. They're still going through some stuff with her children and everything, so please remember that. Uh, anybody on this side? Tammy? Austin Salvation and a place to stay. Anybody else? Over here? Anybody else? Shane? Um, remember my son Jacob, he uh, fell working on his house three, four weeks ago and fractured vertebrae in his neck. Mm. And two doctors said it wasn't that bad, put the brace on, he would be fine in three or four weeks. And he went back yesterday and then I released him from his grace and said it may be worse than what they thought and I think there will be some more x-rays or something but the, uh, it's pretty discouraged he was right. getting out of that, that thing yesterday and getting back to normal and has a little bit of a blow for him so just remember him yes film a break in the neck that's it's nothing to play with yeah. nothing to play with uh, also remember Tammy Walls got a request for her father, Frank Edmonds, which Teresa mentioned. He had a lawnmower accident and broken ribs and bleed on the brain. So that's very seriously. We need to definitely remember him in prayers. Angela, uh, please pray for her dad and Dave Farmer. Uh, Nanny Holbrook, please pray for, is that Leah Ann? And Brianna, I can't read. Sharon. Sharon, okay. Requested, uh, please pray for family that's sick. So there's a lot of sickness and a lot of cancer and stuff out there that's a lot of people we know and, and there's a lot of stuff going on people getting hurt and everything so let's let's remember them in prayer and and we we know almighty god that can take care of everything you know we just need to lay it down at, at, at the altar and let him have it because he's the one that can do it we can't do nothing without him so if y'all would i'm gonna ask you to stand and we're gonna take his to the Lord and also remember our prayer meeting Monday night that's the only announcements I have remember our prayer meeting Monday night 7 o'clock Lord if you would we just ask you to touch every request here God God we just thank you for everything that you do for us God and everything that you're going to do God we just give you all the, all the stuff Lord God because we can't do anything Lord but we know you can and God we ask you to touch the ones that sick God we ask you to touch him that's got the accident in the lower God it's got the bleed on the brain Lord we just ask you to help them and strengthen them God we ask you to touch the ones that sick Lord God we ask you to help them God with every way God and I just praise you to give you all the glory God help this church do what you want us to do God and not what we want Lord God we ask you to touch our pastor God touch them in here give them the word that we need to hear Lord and I just give you all the all the rest, and we praise you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Oh, if y'all, Jesus, say, Amen. Amen.
Come and see him. Help us sing. Come and see him. Need some help. Everybody in the wood, come on. Come and see So, nothing but the blood numbers in. Three sixty-eight. Hallelujah. Three sixty-eight. This year will get the job done.
out of the black book too. Anybody got nothing in this before we swap? Six. Number six. I asked Kayla when we was going to learn some new ones, and she said, when I learned these first, the ones that we've been doing. <laughs>
your car. Okay. You might play it. I know it's been a long time since we've done this, but before I preach what the Lord's put on my, I feel like the Lord's put on my heart tonight. I want you to listen to the words of this. We may haven't done this in a while. So. Diana Farmer says, watching from Cleveland, said Dave is struggling uh, with some issues after his open heart surgery. said, please continue those prayers. And uh, Sadie Greer, I think this is from uh, Warren, Texas, says, uh, please pray for our daughter. Uh, says, a back surgery two weeks ago and still in pain. 
Carol Ann and uh, I believe that's Greer. Carol Ann Greer Drowning. Okay. Let's pray. Can we just for a few moments before we get started in the Word. Father, in the name of Jesus, tonight, God, we lay these requests at your feet. Father, we cast all of our care upon you because we know your Word tells us that you care for us. God, we love you. We can't make it without you. Father, I pray for uh, the farmers. God, I pray for David. Ask you, God, to touch his heart, God. Pray, God, for the ones in Texas, Lord, and this family. Pray, God, that you'll touch them, minister to them. And, God, there's so many other requests here tonight that maybe hasn't been mentioned. But, God, I pray that you'll extend your mighty hands of mercy to every request, God. We lay them at your feet, and I pray that you'll answer these requests according to your riches and according to your glory as only you could do. And we'll be careful tonight to give you all the praise and all the glory. Now, Lord... Tonight I'm about to preach your word, God, and I tremble in my heart to know that I as a man can mess it up. Father, I'm asking you tonight that you'll give us a word that'll help, God. I pray that this word, Father, I pray that it be your word and not mine. God, I'm asking you to help me to yield my tongue, to yield my heart to you tonight. And Father, I pray that you'd just help us, Lord, in this time that we live. Give us something, Father. I pray, God, that you'll feed your sheep here tonight, God. And I pray that you'll have all the glory for it, for it's all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles, the 20th chapter. I have a simple message, but yet it's profound for the time that we live. We've never seen so many attacks. We've never seen the attacks coming on the levels that we're seeing them come. And uh, one guy summed it up, and I thought he'd done a well job when he said, if the devil can't get you, he's coming after your spouse. If he can't get them, he's coming after your children. If he can't get them, maybe he'll come after your finances. And I believe you could sum it up in saying this, that uh, Satan, I'll tell you how he's going to attack, and he's going to attack probably any which way that he can. So there's a lot of people tonight that need a word. There's a lot of people that need a touch, and there's a lot of people that need to touch him. Amen. I want to tell you what I'm going to be preaching about tonight. It's very simple, and I believe it's a place that uh, I'm not sure that we're totally convinced that we're in this place that I'm going to preach tonight. So maybe this may shed some light on it. Maybe this may be something that you're going to need in the days ahead. Maybe tonight we're going to sow a seed in your field, and maybe in a few days or a few years or a few months, maybe God will send somebody else to water that seed, but God will bring the increase, and he'll get all the glory for it. But you may hear something here tonight that you're going to need in the days ahead, or maybe this is where you're at tonight, amen. But uh, I believe that we're in a desperate need tonight as a nation. I believe we're in a desperate need as the church, as the body of Christ. I believe that we're, we need a desperate touch, amen. How many of you know tonight that whenever the situation gets desperate, that we get desperate? That whenever the situation gets desperate, you lose all of your dignity and your, being dignified means little or nothing to you. I remember the times in my life when I was still very shy, just not been saved that long and I was doing a dangerous tree removal business and I had a lot of mishaps up in the air concerning a crane and it could have cost me my life. And in those desperate situations, there were times that in spite of all of my insecurities and in spite of all of my dignity and in spite of everything of me being intimidated by everybody, in spite of everything, is during that moment of desperation, I didn't care who was listening, I cried out to Jesus. Amen. There's times, some of the best prayers I've ever prayed in all of my life is in a moment of desperation whenever I cried out for Jesus. And how many of you know that many times we don't grow in until we hit adversity. How many of you know that through the word of God, amen, that many times that we don't really, nothing happens and we never really are challenged to get a hold of God until we realize the situation is desperate. You know, whenever you realize what you're saved from, it makes your salvation that much more glorious or it does me. Whenever I realize that it was the pits of hell that God saved me from, that it was God's wrath. You know, it's one thing to preach God's grace and preach his mercy and rightly so we believe in that here. But whenever you realize that it was his wrath that his grace saved you from, it has a whole other perspective. When you understand the other side of God and you have a rightly divided word and this gospel is rightly divided to you, it'll make you appreciate it. Let me illustrate that a little bit further if I may. Whenever you're driving down the road and you uh, say a small incident, say you're standing uh, this high right here on this platform maybe or this right here on the altar and you, you bobble just a little bit and somebody grabs you, you might say thank you for that. I appreciate that but it really didn't mean nothing to you because you know the worst thing you might have done was maybe fracture something 
something, it wouldn't have cost you your life. But in the same token, if you're driving down the road and you bobble over into the oncoming lane there and there's a transfer truck coming and somebody says, whoa, and they reach and grab the steering wheel and they pull you out of harm's way and you barely miss the transfer truck and you escape with just moments of losing your life, all of a sudden what they've done for you becomes very precious. All of a sudden it takes on a brand new meaning. All of a sudden you're overwhelmed with gratitude. You're overwhelmed whenever you realize how desperate that situation was. I believe tonight that you and I are in error because we do not understand, nor maybe is it that we don't want to understand. I'm not sure, but I'm not satisfied tonight that you and I believe and understand just how desperate the situation is. Let me tell you how desperate the situation is tonight. There's somebody right now that is laying on a hospital bed, maybe hooked up to a breathing machine. Maybe somebody is sitting at a traffic light in town and it's the last few moments of their life. Little do they know that a transfer truck is about to run over them. Little do they know that daddy may not be coming home tonight. Little do they know that this may be the last few moments of their life. And the question is, is do they know Jesus? Amen. Can I tell you tonight, the situation is desperate. We've played a lot of games. Amen. And we've gotten hung up with a lot of silly doctrine, a lot of crazy things. But my question tonight is, is Jesus Christ the focal point of your life? Are you desperate enough to get up and go after him? Amen. Do you know that he's the only hope that you've got? Amen. I've asked this so many times in this pulpit and we preach this. Maybe this will drive it home and help us to remember. I believe repetition being the teacher tonight, that if you were in need of a drug that was going to heal cancer or had the cure to cancer and someone told you that they had that cure in Gainesville, Georgia tonight, well, would you drive to Gainesville to get that, that cure for that cancer if you knew that was the only hope that you had? Would you get up and go? Amen. I, there was a time that I'd say absolutely, but in the world that we're living in, I'm not sure that some of them would even get up and go after that. Amen. But supposing you got up and you drove to Gainesville and you got there and they told you we're out of the drug, you're going to have to go on to Gainesville, Florida. Would you stop then or would you keep looking? Amen. Or if they got to Gainesville and they told you when you got to Gainesville said, we just sold our last bit, but if you drive down to Miami, amen, you'd find a way. Amen. It wasn't nothing getting your way. If you had to borrow the money, do hitchhike, do whatever it took, you'd go to Miami and looking for the answer because somebody told you and you truly believe that that was the answer to your problem. If you and I tonight truly believe that Jesus Christ was the answer to all of our problems, if he was the answer to everything, if he was the bullseye, I'm confident tonight that you and I would be found in a prayer meeting every day of our life seeking his face. If we truly believe that this was the answer to everything, amen, I believe there'd be some different circumstances surrounding you and I. This message tonight, I believe, is designed, amen, to maybe open our eyes just a little bit and prove to us and judge our own fruit of our own going, amen. There's only one way tonight that you and I can know a tree and that's by the fruit that it bears. Paul told believers in Corinthians said, examine yourself, believers, to see whether you be in the faith. How long has it been since you've took a look at your own fruit of your life? How long has it been since you've looked down and pondered the path of your own feet? Amen. Can you tell that you're getting cold? You're getting indifferent. The things of God doesn't mean to you tonight what they once did mean to you. Amen. How many of you would be honest in your own heart before God tonight? Not by raising hands. It's none of my business or nobody else's. It's between you and the Lord. But how many would be honest and say, there was a time in my life when I was a whole lot closer to God and I loved the things of God. Amen. When I had my first love, there was a time in my life that when me and him, I knew that he was the only answer. He's the only hope that I needed. And I went after him and sought him with all of my heart. Amen. Answer that to yourself tonight. Is there ever a time in your life when you got up and went after him? And may I ask you the question, what happened? Did you forget how desperate the situation is? Have you forgotten tonight that if we don't have Jesus, we die and go to hell? Amen. How many of you don't have lost the idea that God, amen, is a God of wrath also? that God is a God of wrath. How many of you know that God's killed more people than anybody on the face of the earth? Read your Bible, my friend. How many of you know that it's the fear of the Lord that's the beginning of wisdom? How long has it been since we've really had a good, healthy balance and a fear of God? I've told you this so many times that fear is a precious thing and I'll tell you how precious that fear is. Fear is what kept me alive all those years in that dangerous tree removal business that I was in. I was half scared of what I was doing, amen? Because I had a high level of respect before it because I knew that it'd take my life 
life any moment. This could be the day that I didn't go home. And so thus it gave me a good healthy fear and a good reverence for what I was doing to watch everything that I was doing and have precautions of it. Amen. Do you understand that we have a Tallulah Gorge down there and you get close to that thing? I don't know about you, but it's a good healthy fear of falling into that thing and dying and not going home tonight that'll keep me away from the edge. You need a good healthy fear of God. Amen. God's not sitting in heaven waiting on you to mess up so we can sling a lightning bolt at you. You've missed it when the devil's told you and you've bought that propaganda. I've come by to tell you that it's a great thing to have a proper healthy balance of the fear of God in your life. Amen. To cause you to walk where God would have you to walk. Amen. It's a good fear of God. I'm going to tell you this. I've got children back there and I've got a fear that they're going to meet a world that they're not prepared for. Amen. If that don't get me to a prayer meeting, I'm not sure what else would. I'm not talking and hammering on a prayer meeting, but I am talking about your relationship with Jesus Christ. I am asking you tonight, amen, where is he on the totem pole of your success? Is he at the top of it? Is that what you're reaching for? Or have you allowed other gods? I've told you this a lot, amen. Maybe it'll drive it home a little bit more. Last Sunday morning, a lot of people backed up to the boat shed and hooked up to their God and went to the lake. What else have you let get in that's above Jesus? What else? Have, it'll tell the tale every time because I can tell you how to find out who your God is because you'll sacrifice for it. Whatever your God is in your life, that's what you're going to sacrifice for. Have we forgotten how desperate the situation is? Have we have the ostrich mentality? They tell me, I don't know, but they tell me that an ostrich, that whenever it's intimidated, whenever it's frightened, that it'll stick its head in the sand and think it's okay, but yet its body is exposed. Have we came to that place where we think that Satan doesn't attack anymore? Have we got our head in the sand and buried somewhere and we don't realize that Satan is tearing families apart left and right? Do we understand that the situation is desperate? Have we gleaned anything from Scripture at all that whenever a righteous and holy man in the Word of God realized the situation was desperate, he done one thing? And that was go after God with all of his heart and surrender and say, God, we need some help. We don't have the answer. How long has it been since you've been honest with God, amen, that you can't fix everything? You don't have all the answers. That there's some knowledge that's too wonderful for you to understand. There's something God never going to tell you, amen. How long has it been since you've totally rested in that, amen, and got before God and got completely honest and say, God, I don't know, but I know who does. And I'm here asking for help. I want you to look at a story of a king in the Word of God in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I want you to look at this. This man was in a desperate Jehoshaphat. He was in a very desperate situation. And he realized that the situation was very desperate. When the armies of Moab and Ammon were marching toward them, he was in a holy desperation. You can follow the story down. It starts in chapter 1. Follow the story down and you'll find that there was this great army that was gathered and been marching and they were gathered together and heading the battle. And I want you to look what this man of God said. This doesn't sound like you're a Pentecostal preacher today. This doesn't sound like a man in marriage counseling that we hear today. Amen. This doesn't sound like what you hear in the pulpits of America. This doesn't sound like what I hear from the White House. This doesn't sound like what I hear from Congress. It seems that everybody has the answer but yet we seem to be going further and further in the wrong direction. Amen. I wish somebody would stand up and say what Jehoshaphat. I wish somebody would have enough coattail to stand up and say, whoa, something's going wrong. Maybe we don't have all the answers. Look what this man of God said in verse 12. He said, oh, our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither knoweth what we to do. Look at this. Neither knoweth we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. And all Judea, look what it said. All Judah, look, all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children as they looked upon the God of heaven and said, We do not have the might to conquer this thing. Neither do we know what to do. But all of our eyes are upon you. That, my friends, is one of the most precious places that a man of God can be. Is that when he finally comes back down out of the clouds of his own self-righteous hypocrisy and gets good and honest with himself and says, I don't have all the answers.
Do you not understand how many people that we've ministered to one to one that's fighting and struggling and they have had a way personified to them that everybody in the pulpit's perfect and holy and that everybody coming to the church is perfect and holy and they have no trouble. They don't fight with nothing, don't struggle with nothing. Everything is fine. You get saved and it's eternal bliss from the moment you get saved to the last days of your life. That's completely and totally wrong according to this word of God. One man said, you know what the the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost is? And they said, what? And he said, trouble. It wasn't that those men of God got filled and started doing signs, miracles, and wonders that hell started attacking them. But I've been noticing something. Some of the men that's been set free here in the last couple of uh, years of my ministry, whenever they realize that we're all fighting wars. And we've projected a way that we live in a way that we're not struggling. We're not fighting. We don't put up with nothing. We just, everything is okay. Everybody's perfect. I mean, from the day you got saved. And people are looking at us as we're projecting that life up here in this pulpit. And we projected that in Christianity. And people are sitting in the pews and they're locked up in bondage. And they can't get anything dealt with because they're not dealing in truth before God Almighty. But whenever you teach a man when you don't know what to do, get before God and get honest and surrender yourself and say, I don't know what to do. My enemies are about me. I can't get a hold on this thing. Whatever this problem is, I can't. I don't have. Amen. I remember a man not too long ago that told me his mind was slipping, wound up in a mental institute, preaching the Word of God, uh, knows the Bible better than I do. And he said he found himself in a place that where he tried to quote Scripture and he tried to call upon everything he had learned from his childhood. He said there wasn't enough Scripture that I could quote. There was not enough things that I could say. There wasn't enough words that I could speak that it would all go away. But he said when I found my Myself laying there in the mental hospital and realized I'd gone as far as I could go and realized that if God didn't touch me, I wasn't going to get touched. He said it was in that place that I found a great surrender where I surrendered before God Almighty. And he said it was God's grace and it was God's mercy that reached in and pulled me out. And he said, I stand here today and preach the word of God because of his grace and because of his mercy and don't understand but very little of it. That's the reality of this thing. Whenever we preach the truth, I had a man tell me something that shook my world the other day when we deal in truth and honesty with this thing. I had somebody tell me that, talking about an individual that I've known for years and said he, he thinks a whole lot of you. And I, that rattled me when he said that. And I thought about that a whole lot. And I said, you know, all I've ever done is told the guy the truth. And I realized something. People are hungry for the truth. People are tired of going home defeated. They're tired of trying to live perfect in front of everybody else and hold it all together because everybody's looking at me and I've got to hold this image. But yet I'm going home and I'm fighting with every ounce I've got. And I'm just about on the brink of losing the battle. And Satan is ripping me apart because some crazy way I've taken all of my faith and I've placed it within my own works because I believe I have to do something for God to move or I have to do something for him to do anything. When I realize that it's all by grace and it's all by mercy. There is a place of desperation whenever you forget everything. There is a place that whenever we realize a situation is desperate. I don't know whether you realize it here tonight or not. But we are moving fastly and rapidly toward a fully demon possessed world all around us. I have never seen the things that we're dealing with that they're trying to put in our children's mind in the school system right now. I've never seen the stuff and it's everywhere that you look. Listen to me, spouses. Listen, everywhere that you look, there's something telling you there's something out there better than your spouse. Get rid of the old buzzer, throw them out, get you another one. That's what the world will tell you over and over and over and over. It's every which way that you look. I'm going to tell you something. If you don't find yourself a place of surrender and get honest before God... Hell's going to have a field day. Now let me slow down and talk to you for just a moment. I'm not talking about something I got off the internet or something I got off of YouTube. I'm not talking about a study that somebody done 20 years ago. I'm talking about real life episodes that I've been counseling with for the last month. And I've been sincerely asking God for wisdom and how to help these people get out of bondage. And so I've never seen the level of attacks that are coming on people. But you cannot get hung up between grace and law. I said, you cannot get hung up between grace and law. It is completely by grace. And there's something to be said for a man. That'll, yeah, let me zero in a little bit further. I, I come through mostly the Pentecostal ranks. I come through mo- mostly those. And there's one thing that we never could stand. You know what it was? It's for it to get silent. We couldn't stand the silence. And if, and if it got silent, you know what we did? We got up and we made it up. 
We got up and we'd done something. We had to produce. So we had to always having to produce something. But I read about a man right here in the word of God that realized the situation was desperate. I wonder what you'll do. Amen. I wonder what some of them done. I seen what some of them done. They came to the altars and they came and we made it up and we made a show. But they went home to broken marriages. And some of them are not here anymore. There is something to be said for truth. That when you get honest before God, I don't know if it's somebody that needs this tonight or you're going to be faced with this in the days of head. But I, there's going to come a time when you're going to realize there's nothing you can do but cry out for God's grace and cry out for his mercy. I want you to read you another story right here. You've read here in the Old Testament of a man of God that said, Lord, we don't know what to do. And I'll give you these are uh, in verse 15 at the end of it. He says, for the battle is not yours, but it's the Lord. And you find this is where we pull the great quote that we say stand still and see the salvation of God said God's going to fight this battle for you and it came from a man that was being honest that stood before God and said God the situation is desperate and we need some help we can't fight these people we can't do this they'll overcome us God and he had great fear came upon him and he called a fast and he stood still before the Lord and said our eyes are upon you there's going to come a time in your life. Listen to me, please. You listen to me. If you don't hear nothing else I say tonight, there's going to come a time in your life where all you can do is get your eyes upon him and trust him with all of your heart. Something come to me the other day that really helped me a lot when I was I'm studying this out. You're going to die one day. There's going to come a time in your life. It's going to be the last few seconds of your life. And your, your heartbeat's going to quit. And you're going to live somewhere for eternity. What will you do in that moment? Answer this to yourself between you and the What will you do in that moment? Because then the situation is desperate. Are you going to hope that you did enough good works? Or are you going to look God and say, I'm at the end of my life. And all of my eyes are upon you. I'm trusting Jesus Christ with all of my heart. I'm putting all of my faith, all of my hope, all of my trust completely and exclusively in him. Because that's the only hope that you're going to have to cross that river of Jordan and appear in the presence of God. You see, whenever the situation gets desperate and you look at the end of it, then you begin to see a lot of foolishness that we've done between here and there. I want to read you one more story and then we're going to close. And I want you to look at this with me. Mark chapter 5. Mark the fifth chapter. I'll give you just a moment. Mark chapter 5, verse 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. Do you see that? She spent everything that she had, and it just got worse and worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she fell in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he had said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be made whole of thy plague. Listen, guys. Many people were thrown in Jesus, but only one touched him. 
I said many of them were thrown and many of them were going after no telling what was going on that day. How many people was there through the popularity, but only one touched him. As Kayla comes to the piano tonight. He said in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, he said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I shall give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And he said, you'll find rest unto your souls. Why? Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You can go through your whole life. I've ministered to folks in the last days that are having terrible, terrible problems. And they knew the word, but they never knew the God of the word. They never had the relationship with Jesus. They've never been to a place of desperation. I don't know about you. Maybe it's different for some of us, but for me, I was dying and going to hell. I'd come to a place in my life that I lost everything that I had. I had nothing. I was staying in a spare bedroom with a bunch of drunks. Had got to the end of my rope and tied a knot into it and was sick and tired of everything. Everything I touched fell apart. I was in a moment of desperation. I was at the lowest point I've ever been in all of my life. I crawled out of that bed and I began to cry out to him. I began to reach for heaven with everything I know to do. And that night, you've heard me preach it so many times right here in this church. That night, Jesus Christ walked in my bedroom in a moment of desperation. In that moment of desperation. Is the situation desperate for you? Because many people are going to throw on him. But there's only one that day that touched him. I said, there's many of them that will say, God help me. There's many people that will say, Lord, we need some help. Lord, bless the food and rightly so, no doubt. But there'll always be maybe one that'll reach in and touch him. There'll always be one that'll get to a point of desperation. They spend everything that they had and there's no other hope. He is the only answer and I'm going after him. Whatever cost. That's the ones that'll touch him. And when you touch him, dear friends, it'll change your life. I had a guy that he's dead and gone now. He was on the pulpit committee of the first church I pastored. And he was praying one night about a man that was ill. And that man's gone on to be with the Lord also. But this guy had a brain aneurysm. And he was messed up. He was just no doubt needed a touch from the Lord. And this friend of mine told me, he said, I prayed, I prayed, I prayed, and I prayed. God touch him, God touch him. Oh, Jesus, touch him, Jesus, touch him. He said, I prayed that night after night after night after night. Jesus, touch him. He said, finally, one day, he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, he needs to touch me. And he understood what he meant. I want to tell some of you tonight, this message may not be for right this moment in your life. Some of you are going to be facing some days ahead. The situation is going to be desperate. And I want to tell you, and I want you to remember this tonight, the only hope you're going to have is to touch Him. Not just know about Him. You need to know Him. Not just quote a scripture. That's good too, don't get me wrong. But there's going to come a time in your life that you're going to have to get up and go after Him because He's the only hope that you're going to have. And can I tell you that He's the only hope that you need. We argue over doctrine and it ought to be done a method of this way. It needs to be done this way and the Jesus only thing. I've never seen such argument, but if you just get Jesus, everything goes away in him. Everything disappears in him. I want to tell you this as we close. Years ago when I first got saved, now I don't have visions all the time like some folks. But I remembered years ago, I just had got saved, was called to preach and was just looking for the Lord. And I kept seeing all the time a door. With a light shining around it. Like the door was opening. I've seen that for years. I'd ask men of God and they'd say, I don't know what it is, but I believe you're seeing right. And I said, it's some of the beautiful light I've ever seen all of my life. Years later, I started seeing it in a different way. I saw this in, in that direction, just a gigantic, bright white light. And I just, for years, I, I could see that. And it never made any sense to me. Years later, I, I started seeing it in a different way. I could see it, and I could see myself walking toward it. And I walked into it, and I completely disappeared in it. I realized that light was Jesus. It wasn't nothing I could do to be holy. It was my faith completely and totally in Him, walking toward Him, losing all confidence in flesh and everything around me, and walking toward Him. And I completely disappeared in Him. Can I tell you, Whenever you touch him, 
and you're under the blood, that's a precious place to be. Whenever God looks at you, thank God he don't see you or your sin because he's a holy God. Thank God that whenever he looks at me, he'll see the blood of Jesus. There's a great refuge right there that's not preached on. I want to challenge you tonight. Have you touched him? Have you ever went up and got after him? I don't know where you are on your 12 years. I don't know where you are on spending everything that you've got. I don't know where you are about the gimmicks. I don't know where, I don't, I don't know how many books you're going to have to read until you find out there's only one answer and his name is Jesus. I appreciate the good books. I do. They've helped a lot of people. But sometimes you get caught up in the mechanics of things. You get caught up in the mechanics of doing word studies. You get caught up in the mechanics of everything. And then you realize one day that, my goodness, he's the answer. Just find him. If I just get a hold of him, if I could just touch him, I can be made whole. And it all goes away there. I don't want to linger on tonight longer than we should. But some of you are right now, and it may even be more desperate than what you think it is. When the situation gets desperate, like Peter, whenever Peter went under, I know they gig him because he took his eyes off the Lord. But you need to know that when Peter went under, he knew the situation got desperate. He knew who to call on. When the situation gets desperate, you know the answer tonight is Jesus. Amen. I, I feel like praying for the ones that are watching the live feed before we cut the live feed. I want to pray for them tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, I'm asking you that you'll touch. I'm asking you, God, that you'll touch the ones that may be watching. The situation may be desperate. <laughs> Lord, they may not know what to do. I pray tonight that you'll touch them. I pray, God, that you'll encourage their hearts. I pray, God, you'll show them how dim this world really is. And the lights are slowly fading. Because nothing will compare to the brightness of Jesus Christ. Nothing will compare to the brightness of your glory. God, I ask you tonight, Lord, that you'll help. I pray that you'll touch. I pray that you'll guide. I pray that you'll open their eyes tonight, God, that they may see that Jesus is the only hope. He's the only way. That, God, they may come running toward you. I don't know who's listening. But I want to tell you tonight before I leave here, you need to touch him. You need to get desperate. You need to lose all your dignity and go find him. And just go touch him. Because it's all cured. It's all healed in him and him alone. And you don't have to understand it. You don't have to figure it all out. He done knows everything that needs to be known. Just rest in the fact that he knows it all. And yield to him with all of your heart. Father, I pray that you'll touch tonight. And I ask you, Father, that your will be done. Johnny Bryant says, please pray for me. Vicki Wilbank says, please pray for my family. Lord, I pray for these tonight and their families. I pray that Jesus Christ be famous in all of their lives, in their heart. May he be bigger than everything to them. May tonight we recalibrate our hearts toward Calvary. May tonight that there be a holy desperation ignited in our hearts once again that we will get desperate as we look at the shape of our nation, the shape of our town, the shapes of our families, that we get desperate once again, God, that there be a holy desperation come on us once more, God, that we'll get desperate enough to humble ourselves before you and seek your face and pray, God, and turn from our wicked ways that you may heal our land. I pray, God, tonight that this message be a beginning of lighting the fire of holy desperation in your people once again. That we may get desperate 
for your touch. That we may get desperate to touch you. That we may get desperate for revival. That we may get desperate for a move of God. That we may realize that within our own hearts we're bankrupt. We can't make it within our own selves. That we must have your grace. That your glory, we must touch your glory once again, God. Father, please help us tonight, I pray. That there be a holy desperation. Rekindled in our hearts. Rekindled in our lives. We'll give you all the praise and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name. These altars are open if anybody wants to come and pray.